Welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 72, Tarquins and Republicans. It is of a Rome henceforth free that I am to write the history. Her civil administration and the conduct of her wars, her annually elected magistrates, the authority of her laws supreme over all her citizens. So Livy begins Book 2 of Ab Urbe Condita, his history of the Eternal City. Rome is finally free of the cruel rulership of one guy with a lot of power and a bunch of rich guys with slightly less power. Rejoice that Rome shall now be ruled by two guys with a fair amount of power and a bunch of rich guys with a lot more power. Huzzah! The Roman Republic that Livy was writing so wistfully about traditionally cites 509 BC as the year of inception. Although truthfully, it's not quite a true republic just yet. This transitional government seems to be making up the rules as it goes along, which makes sense seeing as none of it was exactly planned. Of course, this is all fine and dandy, but none of it will matter so long as the great boogeyman of Rome, Tarquinius the overly fond of himself, still lives. A guy like him, willing to do anything to get power, uh, refer to the caber-tossing father-in-law incident, well, he's not going to just mosey on off into the sunset, especially since all his stuff is still in Rome and it's been confiscated. Even the royal grain fields, his personal whole foods, was dug up and simply chucked into the Tiber. The new leaders of Rome figured this would be a great visual depiction for rejecting the monarchy. Surprisingly, the message was somehow lost on the hungry masses, who would have been more receptive with some kind of bread-based metaphor. Yet these grumbling tummies aren't as much a problem as grumbling egos, namely those of the young and the rich. A little backstory. Tarquinius had sent ambassadors to Rome while he was in exile in the hopes of becoming king again and, failing that, getting all his stuff back. The unofficial record states that the entire Senate gave a great big double salute of the Digitus Impudicus, which historians summarized as a vote of nay. Right, well that just means on to plan B, and something more underhanded. The Senate could not be swayed, true. After all, what could the ambassadors offer that these men don't already have? Power? Money? Status? Check, check, and check. But what of the sons and nephews of these senators, hmm? Many here hushed promises that if they were to remove the new consuls and help restore Tarquinius to the throne, why, great rewards could be theirs. Power, wealth, status, uh, which they kind of have already. Oh, but it'll be so much more, and faster. And so a plan is set in motion. On a certain night, these conspirators would meet with the ambassadors at the home of two nephews of Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus, husband to the deceased Lucretia and one of the two consuls. His nephews were most certainly in on this, as were two sons of the other consul, Lucius Junius Brutus. Their reasons for all this are unknown much like why out of anywhere in all of Rome, they chose to meet in a well-known location instead of the usual secret backroom places these sort of meetings happen in. Who can say? But a house slave overheard their seditious talk and ran to alert a local patrician, Publius Valerius. Valerius was there when Lucretia's death sparked the revolution and was known for being a friend to the lower classes. After promising to keep the slaves safe, he heads out to the house with a band of armed associates, expecting a rumble. Oddly enough, the house was empty. The boys must have stepped out for a bit. That's about par for the course for these rebels without a clue, because, additionally, they also left incriminating letters from the ambassadors out in the open. Eventually, they returned home and were overtaken by Valerius and friends. The conspirators were dragged through the forum up to the Senate House by their robes. And by that I mean their robes were wrapped like nooses around their necks so they could literally be dragged in front of an emergency session of the Senate. I ask you now to picture Brutus, seeing his two sons treated like this and learning of their treason all at once. The boys were asked if they deny the charges and to give some small inkling as to why they would possibly do this. And yet all they did was quietly weep. So what to do? On one hand, here are a group of traitors, corrupted by an exiled tyrant to murder the current rulers of Rome, overthrow the fledgling government, and restore this dictator to power. On the other hand, their family, which should be enough of an argument. 
The punishment for treason is ultimate and set in stone. To spare them would show that even in this new republic, laws once again don't apply to the rich. But they're your sons. The final decision is made by Brutus, and the law must be upheld. His sons would be tortured and then executed in full view of the public. Right after the Senate convenes, actually. They're brought back into the forum so all would know the fate of Rome's enemies, even those within her walls. Witnesses differ in their accounts of Brutus's reaction to all this. Some say that he cried out while his sons were being scourged, but remained calm and still during their beheading. Others say Brutus remained emotionally cold throughout the ordeal. Both seem to agree that he never once looked away or excused himself, and that in the end, he's viewed as a paragon of Stoicism. By Roman historians, at least. Greek historians think this bit is all sorts of seriously messed up, and subtly remind their readers of the age-old maxim, These Romans are crazy. Regardless of what the right decision was, Brutus expected solidarity from his co-consul, Colatinus, and that the man would issue the same sentence on his nephews. After all, Rome needs to see unity between its two leaders. Otherwise, it's one person calling the shots, and getting away from that is kind of the point here. Colatinus reminds Brutus that he couldn't agree more, and that as co-counsel, he has equal authority. Thus, he can make his own separate decisions, and his nephews should go free. But seeing their chums' heads lopped off probably set them straight, you know? And he's right, on both accounts. But none of that really matters to a guy who was willing to accept his son's silence as an admission of guilt. Brutus valued the future of his city above the lives of his own flesh and blood. Stoicism be damned. And he grimly tells Colatinus, Not while I am alive shall you be able to free those who are traitors to their country. Sounds like a threat. Well, a political threat. The Senate is called and Brutus unleashes his oratorical assault. I could wish, citizens, that Colatinus, my colleague here, held the same sentiments as I do in everything, and that he showed his hatred and enmity towards the tyrants. Not by his words only, but by his actions as well. But since it had become clear to me that his sentiments are the opposite of my own, and since he is related to the Tarquinii, considering his private advantage instead of the public good, I have made my own preparations to prevent him from carrying out the mischievous designs he has in mind. Colatinus was indeed a cousin of the exiled king, but come on, that shouldn't matter. After what happened to his wife, was he not at the forefront of the revolution? How could he have been elected consul if he didn't have the support of the people and the senate? Well, he tries to make his case, but Brutus was a better speaker and a better politician. The two kind of exchange monologues back and forth, but right off the bat, Brutus has already planted doubt in his audience. Colatinus doesn't hate the Tarquins the way a true Roman does. And that's because he practically is a Tarquin. And yes, let's skip over the ever-so-minor detail that Brutus himself was also kind of related to the royal family, but hey, he's not the one on trial here. Despite all his attempts otherwise, Colatinus fights a losing battle. Brutus has successfully painted him as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Eventually, it's his father-in-law, Spurius Lucretius Trisipitinus, who implores Colatinus to step down and leave Rome with his honor intact. For the greater good and all. With some protest, he agrees, but not before reminding all that his only crime was showing compassion towards his kinsmen. He's given a retirement package and sent to dwell in Lavinium. However, the consummate politician, Brutus loudly applauds this action, asking Colatinus not to resent either him or the Senate for everything that's gone down. Oh, and don't look at this as a banishment from Rome, but to, and I quote, consider his change of residence as a sojourn abroad. The dual consulship experiment already had its first casualty, and Brutus was now technically sole ruler of Rome. Maybe that was the whole plan all along. Put up with Colatinus until he slips up, and then assume total power of the city. Maybe. But he's a member of the Junii family, not the Julii, and being king was never in the plan. The vacant consul seat is quickly filled by the man responsible for uncovering the conspiracy in the first place, Publius Valerius. It's still 509 BC, by the way, and while all this drama was happening, the villain of our story, Tarquinius Superbus, has given up getting his job back the easy way. Now he's wrangling up military support from the Etruscans, although only two cities, Vi and Tarquuna, agree to help. At a forest on Rome's northern border, Tarquinius brings his allies to confront the Roman army, 
led by Brutus. In the first battle of this sort of Roman Republic, Rome is victorious, but not without a heavy cost. Brutus is slain after taking out one of Tarquinius's sons. A glorious Roman death, to be sure. Of course, that also means another vacant consul's seat, and I know what you're thinking. There's already a man who's perfect for it. He's a veteran politician, has hands-on experience with the job, and was a leader of the revolution. Yep, let's all say his name together now. Spurius Lucretius Trisipitinus. Oh, it just rolls off the tongue. The elder statesman and father of Lucretia was tapped to bring wisdom and gravitas to the office. Yes, he'd go down in the history books as a pillar of society. Or he would have if he hadn't died a few days after the appointment. So one more time, and still 509 BC, mind you, consul number five is Marcus Horatius Pulvillus, another leader of the revolution. There's no record of him hiring every augur and soothsayer in Rome to prove the office wasn't cursed, but I have to imagine some avian sign gave him the all clear. I suppose a positive take on the year of the five consuls is that each transition occurred peacefully. Well, aside from Brutus dying in battle. There's no attempted coups, no, wouldn't it be easier if I was the only one in charge? It all went about rather seamlessly. Which is good for Rome, but bad for Tarquinius, who has grown further desperate in his attempts. The cities of Vi and Tarquuna were little fish in the Etruscan League. Now it's time for something bigger, like a tuna or a marlin or something. This would be the wealthy city of Clusium, modern-day Cusi, and its king, Lars Porsena. The man had a reputation for military genius, and his kingdom was powerful. Employing his forces meant Tarquinius was out of options. Should Porsena be victorious and install Tarquinius to the throne before returning home, well, the errant tyrant might be less a king and more a client ruler. And that's, of course, if Porsena leaves. But desperate times call for desperate measures. News of invasion reached Rome as rumors spread over what he would do to the city. The public panicked at the thought. This in turn led to panic in the Senate over what the people were planning to do to the senators. See, for all their talk of a liberated Rome, the lower classes were still kept on a tight leash by a fearful upper class. There's a lot more of them than us, so the thought went, that should they one day realize this, Jupiter help us all. With a very real crisis looming, this might push the people into open rebellion. So in order to prevent a fear-induced uprising, the Senate passes a series of public mollification acts that include exempting the poor from a new war tax and nationalizing the salt industry. Ooh, seizing private business? Sounds kind of dictatory. But with rampant price gouging happening with this crucial commodity, the Senate felt they had no choice. It's 508, a year later. The forces of Lars Porsena are expected any day now, and the city is in lockdown, with citizens from the countryside seeking refuge within Rome's walls. The city was well protected on all sides, although if there was a weak point, more of a X-Wings shoot here point, well that would be a wooden bridge over the Tiber River connecting to a gateway. This is where the Etruscans chose to attack, and Rome's defenders did not last long. Soldiers broke rank and ran towards the city. All seemed lost, except for the legendary heroism of a soldier named Horatius. The story goes that amidst the din and panic, he told the two remaining officers to run to the other side of the bridge and start dismantling it. He would buy them time. But they start chopping away at the ropes and wooden supports while Horatius fights on, almost as if possessed by the very spirit of Mars himself. Once the bridge was on the verge of collapse, his men shout for him to run across, but Horatius wouldn't hear it. He's staying until the bridge is completely destroyed. Keeping in mind that the Etruscans have stopped trying to engage him in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and have switched over to missile attacks, peppering the lone soldier with arrows and javelins. The bridge finally collapses, and it couldn't come fast enough. Horatius was fading from his wounds, a spear in his butt being the most grievous. Still, the guy dove into the river and swam to safety in full armor against a strong current, mind you. Horatius survives, and later on a grateful city builds a statue to him. It gave him a large land grant and put him on a permanent pension. All his meals were covered for life. His physical disabilities following the battle might prevent him from working his new land, but Rome would not forget someone who gave so much in her defense. All right, that's all great and inspiring, but the Etruscans haven't left. In fact, they're settling in for a nice long siege of the city. The weeks pass into months, and with food supplies running low and the public on the brink of starvation, a peace treaty is signed and Porsena goes home, 
Glory to Rome. Not buying it, huh? What, you think the Roman historians would just gloss over his stuff? Okay, well, some accounts state that a young Roman noble snuck into the Etruscans' camp to assassinate Porsena. Only problem is, he didn't know what Porsena looked like, and assumed that a big guy wearing a purple robe surrounded by soldiers was the king. Nope. He killed Porsena's accountant, who was in the middle of divvying out paychecks. The Roman is grabbed and dragged before the real king, who listens to the kid give a whole monologue about being one of hundreds of would-be assassins, blah blah blah, strike me down and I will become more powerful than you can imagine, yada yada yada. Well, Porsena is so impressed with his chutzpah that he calls off the whole siege of Rome. The end. And this may very well have taken place. But for the missing part of the puzzle here, we turn to a non-Roman historian, our old friend Dionysius of Halicarnassus, who writes, after their departure, the Roman Senate voted to send Porsena a throne of ivory, a scepter, a crown of gold, and a triumphal robe, which had been the insignia of the kings. Sure, Porsena might have been concerned that an entire army of assassins was after him. Hmm, better stay away from haystacks. Or that there really wasn't a need to continue with the war. But the most likely reason here is that he was absolutely bought off. Now, you can also find some research to suggest that the Roman gift didn't accompany a peace treaty, but rather it's a token of submission. Porsena does exactly what Tarquinius was afraid of and decided to stick around after his victory. This would have been a short occupation, though, and regardless of which version is correct, the Etruscan army splits off to attack a Latin city south of Rome, is defeated by local forces, and has to return back to Clusium. Their loss is Rome's gain, as a year later Porsena tries one more time to put Tarquinius on the throne, only with diplomacy. After being politely told to knock it off by Roman ambassadors, Porsena actually drops the whole thing and tells Tarquinius, who's been a guest at his court, to hit the road. A treaty of friendship is declared between the two cities, accompanied by the return of some Roman hostages to boot. As for our miserable Macbeth Tarquinius, well, bad things come in threes, don't they? At some point in the early 490s BC, he makes one more attempt at the throne. I know, I'm getting tired of him too. He's given up on the Etruscans and has asked a coalition of Latin tribes to get him the victory he oh so deserves. Now at this time, Rome was already in a militaristic kind of mood. They're like that most of the time, but especially so right now, as they had recently been dealing with some young Sabine guys who thought it would be funny to abduct some Roman women. You know, like what happened like two centuries ago? Haha. <laughs> uh, yeah, because the Romans are famous for their sense of humor, right? Yeah. War is declared, although there isn't any actual fighting. And that may have to do with Sabine fear over Rome announcing a new political position called the Magister Populi, Master of the Infantry. On paper, that is. It'll soon be called by the more familiar title of dictator. The Roman dictator is very different from the modern sense of the word, much like the Greek version of tyrant. This is a government-appointed position with a term limit of six months. The idea with this is that one guy essentially gets carte blanche to do whatever is necessary to respond to an extraordinary threat facing Rome. Sometimes the dictator was one of the co-consuls, Sometimes the threat wasn't militaristic, although most of the time it was. And whatever the dictator felt was necessary to do to contain or crush the threat, well, it would get done without worrying about what the laws say. Why this new position was created is unclear, but it will be used with some frequency throughout the Republic's history. For now, Aulus Posthumius is named dictator and leads his forces for what they hope will be the final confrontation with the ex-king who can't take no for an answer. The Battle of Lake Regulus is a resounding victory for Rome, and Tarquinius finally, finally stops trying. And, most likely in 495 BC, dies in Cumae, the only city that would still take him in. Thus, with his passing, Rome officially is done with the kingship. Hail to the king, baby. At the start of the 5th century BC, the New Republic had successfully held fast against these early threats. Rival Latin cities were quiet mostly, uh, same for the Etruscans, and Rome even attracted the attention of the Mediterranean Ferengi themselves, Carthage. 509 BC is the date of their first treaty, which established friendship between the two nations and saw Rome exaggerate a little bit about the extent of their territory. Of course, that's not to say everything was rosy. Far from it. 
As a rule of thumb, any time in Roman history, maybe in all of history, but especially in Roman history, when the upper classes feel like things couldn't be any better, an ugly truth rears its head. The plebs are revolting. Which, for the time period, could literally be true. Bathing as a cultural pastime probably isn't widespread yet. But the plebs are reaching a breaking point. Military veterans are being imprisoned and tortured over unpaid debts. Families are losing ancestral lands to loan sharks. And even with this new representative government, there is no true voice of the common Roman. All of these ingredients can make for a pretty explosive stew. Oh, but why stop there? Italic tribes beyond Rome hope to capitalize on all this civil unrest and stop the city before it's too much to handle. Greek Syracuse defeats an Etruscan fleet around 474, which might be a good thing for Rome, as the Etruscans have been more enemy than friend, but that just means one more rival to keep an eye on. And perhaps most troubling of all, sticking with the Etruscans for a moment, comes towards the end of the 5th century. Amidst their diminishing influence in the region, Etruscan ambassadors arrive with grim news from the north of a new and alien threat. Already the land near the Alps has been conquered and settled by people with bizarre and savage customs. Their men grow their hair and beards long, sometimes in braids. They clean themselves using a mixture of ash and animal fat called sapo, or maybe soap. It's hard to tell with their crazy language. But worst of all, if the stories are to be believed, is that one of these brutes, a real titan of a man with red hair and an insatiable appetite, he defeated an entire army by himself, collecting their helmets as gruesome trophies of war. Sounds like just another day in Rome, and that'll all be explained next time on the podcast history of our world.